All right, guys, welcome to One Million Cups. My name's Toby, and I'm one of the organizers here, along with, I'm gonna pass the mic this time. Courtney. Britton. Brian. Milton. And uh, so raise your hand if you're here for the first time. Welcome, thanks for coming. Um, raise your hand if you've been here more than 25 times. All right, our veterans, thank you. We'll, we'll recognize a few of you guys later. Uh, before we get started, we're gonna, we have uh, every week, this is a, a uh, what is this? Educational, educational program every week where we have two entrepreneurs get up and speak for about six minutes and then there's Q&A. And um, each week we also have a, an expert panel that we force to sit next to each other really closely over here. And uh, so before we get going, let's have them stand up and do a quick intro. Uh, hey everybody, my name is Nate Allen. Um, I'm a two-time One Million Cups presenter, first-time judge. Uh, name of my company is Dev Copilot. We take the Copilot role in a software startup to whoever's making product decisions, help them get to their destination. Nate, it's important to note we're not judging them unless they're terrible, so we're here to advise them. <laughs> My name is Jeff Kopakin uh, from the Kopakin Law Firm, and I work with uh, small businesses that are in growth mode to maximize profit and minimize risk. Yeah, we're not judging them unless they're absolutely terrible. No. Uh, good morning. My name is Andy Talbert. Uh, my background is actually, I think I'm, I'm the marketing person on the, the panel, but I am in one million cup circles best known for Snow & Company, the uh, frozen cocktail bar in Kansas City where a lot of entrepreneurs hang out at. So, Before you put the mic down, we'd like you guys to, we, don't, we want to recognize you for being the first ever back-to-back -back panelist. Back-to-back so, champs. Panel and it's champs. mainly because you said... We want to be back-to-back -back yes, panelists. It is so, true. It is true. Welcome. Yes. Thank you. Self-promotion. Uh, let's get started. Our first group up is the uh, Pop Bookings. Hi. I'm a person. And this person is marketing a brand to you. And when you have a personal connection with a brand, you are much more likely to remember and to engage with that brand. This is a special form of marketing called experiential marketing. It's when you experience a brand through engagement with a person. More companies are realizing that this form of marketing is much more effective at creating brand loyalty than any other form of marketing. Clicker. So, they're putting more and more of their marketing budgets towards putting a person in front of consumers. They hire specialized staffing agencies to help find these people to work these events. We call them brand ambassadors. And these agencies cannot staff these jobs fast enough. For example, let's say Coca-Cola is sponsoring NASCAR. The agency they hire is tasked with finding people to work all the events and pass out samples and represent the Coca-Cola brand. So how do they find these people? Craigslist, where people go to sell used washing machines and advertise garage sales. So when they have 20 different events in 20 different cities across the country, and they need two to four people to work each of these events, and they have a little over a week to staff all of them, it gets pretty stressful. So the agency posts an ad in each city on Craigslist, which then leads to hundreds and hundreds of emails from both qualified and unqualified candidates. They will then spend hours manually sifting through these emails, bouncing back and forth between programs, and playing lots and lots of phone tag. They spend three to four hours just to staff one person. Enter pop bookings. Staying true to the pop and pop bookings, what used to take hours can now be done in seconds with just a click of a button. On our platform, an agency can log on, create an event, pick who they want to work the event, and our system sends a text message to that person's phone in which they can simply say, yes, I'm interested, or no, I'm not. We have even taken it a step further. Booking an event is one thing. Managing that event is even harder. On pop bookings, an agency can track the progress of their events, communicate with staff, and see real-time analytics about their staff, 
all on one simple dashboard. With pop bookings, these companies can spend less time on the administrative tasks and more time better serving their clients and growing their business. <laughs> um, my line? Competition. Ah, competition, yes, <laughs> sorry about that. So, um, to be fair, there have been some attempts at introducing technology into this industry. Some agencies will even have staff portals, but they're clunky, hard to use, and straight out of the 90s. And each of our competitors don't solve the central issue. There's no single source to find and book the quality talent. This, agency, or this industry is extremely fragmented. They still have to leave whatever platform they're using and hop on a Craigslist if they have any jobs in a new city. The experiential marketing industry is big. A 2.2 billion US and 76 billion worldwide kind of big. And it's growing fast. Faster than the US economy at an average annual rate of 12%. It's growing so fast, in fact, that technology has not yet caught up with it until now. We're starting in the experiential marketing industry because we know it well and is in the most immediate need for disruption using technology. But we plan to scale the pop bookings tool into other industries that use temporary labor, such as construction, pharmaceutical consulting, IT, just to name a few. Since January, we have 11 beta testers using our product as a core function of their day-to-day -day business. We have over 1,000 jobs that have been booked using the pop bookings tool. We have over 11,000 brand ambassadors receiving work through pop bookings, and we're only in beta. So how do we make money? It's simple, our pricing is super simple. 3% of anything booked on pop bookings. We also offer premium profiles for the talent to get booked for more jobs. There are thousands of agencies who are dying to use this tool. This industry needs this platform, but don't let us be the only ones to tell you that. This is an actual quote from one of our beta testers, Shannon. She is using pop bookings daily to manage her business. We have talked to over 100 agencies just like hers, and they all said the same thing. So why are we the ones to change the way people find and hire temporary labor? Scott and I have been in the experiential marketing industry on both the talent and the agency side for over five years. For the last two years, we have owned and operated an agency called We Are Fine Line. It was through that experience that we found this hole in the market. We felt the pain, we know the pain, and we know how to fix it. So we went and found someone who's built a scalable technology for a previous startup called Last Minute Golfer, which sold to the Golf Channel in 2007. His name is Joe Abley, and he is our CTO. Since then, we've brought on Lance Windholz, a partner in one of Kansas City's most well-known dev shops, <laughs> and he is taking us mobile. Together, we are changing the way people find and hire temporary labor. We have the team, there is a pain, we have the solution. We've got a beautiful product, and we have traction. So, if you would like to take part in this exciting journey, please come find us after the presentations. Thank you. Thank you. All right, we'll start with questions from the panel and then we'll open it up uh, after a couple of those. Awesome, uh, great presentation as always. I uh, wanted to have you clarify, I guess, who you view the primary customer here, and it's all right if there's more than one customer, but understanding like what space you're selling this into. Sure, so uh, a lot of people don't quite understand the event staffing part of things. We do mostly promotional events. So when you see someone representing a brand at a high volume event, at a concert, sporting event, trade shows is a big one, anything where they're, they're pushing a product and representing a brand, that's the type of staffing we do. I noticed that you guys have 11 betas, but 11,000 applicants. Is that a number that will continue to, is that kind of industry standard of what you'll require? It seems like that could be problematic as you take on more customers just managing that much data. Please speak to that. Sure thing. So most of these agencies do staff nationally. It's very rare to find an agency who will staff regionally because the client wants, so if they're a sponsor of an event, a music festival, for example, there's 20 different stops across the country, so they need to have talent in most of those markets. And so they'll usually have a pretty sizable database if they've been in business for a while. Uh, most of that database is probably going to be a little old, so that's our job to make sure that those people are active, to uh, that they're really still doing this type of work because there's 
it's really hard to track that amount of people. And so our system, we're building in algorithms now to where as they use the system, it becomes smarter, it'll be self-sustaining, they'll be able to see, you know, response rates are dropping, this person might not be active, all of those kinds of things we're taking into account now. So a little bit of follow-up to that. Are the brand ambassadors coming to pop bookings to give the data or you're currently acquiring it from the, uh, the brand itself? So the agencies bring their database and the uh, brand ambassadors come to our platform. And to, uh, to add to that, a lot of this talent works for multiple agencies. No single agency can offer enough work to one person. They usually, each agency on average, maybe two gigs a month, but that's not enough for someone who's full time with this kind of work. So when these agencies come on board, we have a lot of overlap which is another service that we're providing to the agencies, is when the agency rates the talent on what kind of job they did, the rest of the agencies can see how that overlaps. So. Um, first of all, thanks for coming, great presentation. Um, could you go into a little bit more de detail about your go-to-market strategy and how you're gonna tackle this experiential marketing market first? Sure, so um, we go straight to the agency owners and we talk to them about what we're doing, bring them on board. They, again, have their own talent that they deal with. And word of mouth in this industry is crazy. It's, you know, the talent talk, you know, at events, they're, you know, on break. They just talk, how'd you get this job? What agency did you work for? And hey, did you notice that you got this pop bookings text? I mean, people are already talking and we're trying to stay, you know, in beta mode. But um, as far as that, I mean, that's really what we're doing, so. What's, what's crazy is that, well, we owned an agency, so we're building this based on our experience, and when we send out cold emails, we're getting a 30% response rate of people saying, holy crap, this exists, like, I, I need this product. So, um, just with that experience, and we're building it specifically for these agencies, it's, it's almost too easy to, uh, to bring them on board. All right, let's open it up to anybody else that wants to ask a question. And we have one over here. Sure, how do you make sure that brand ambassadors are educated about your product? Is there a rating system like Uber drivers? Or how do you make sure that they're the best ones getting going to market with the customer's product? Yep, so we do, thank you for the question. We have ratings and reviews. Um, the agencies, at the end of the event, um, so we broke it, let me start with this. We've broken it up into three categories. There's pre-event, during event, and post-event. And we, ha we help with all of that. So pre-event is finding the talent and booking them. During event is managing them and communicating with them. And then post-event is paying them and rating and reviewing them. And that is, and similar to Uber, the talent can also rate and review the agencies because there are agencies out there that um, have a less than reputable reputation and it's keeping quality control in the industry. So. Great idea. A uh, couple of questions. Um, the first is, um, what are you doing to protect yourself against competition that'll invariably rise up? Um, the second is, you mentioned you've been in beta since January. So what's going on before you go fully live, and when do you expect that to happen? So we have a features list that we've built from our alpha testers that said, I want to see this built, I want to see that built, got that all you know, down, and then we raised money to get that really built and to make it happen. And so right now we're building features and we're talking to agencies and if they want a certain feature that we don't have and once we have it, we just sign them up. And so we're testing all of those things as we go along and as we grow. And the, the main kicker for us to go live is launching our mobile app. It's in production right now. And um, I don't want to put an exact date on it, but before the end of the year, we will be live. So that's, uh, and then uh, remind me of your first question. Competition. Oh, competition, that's right. Uh, we we <laughs> working harder, better, and, and stronger than them. That's, that's the plan right now is just first person to market will be, it, it's a, it's a land grab right now to who can get on the mobile fastest. And so we're just working faster. That's our plan. Thank Question you. here in the center. 
Hi, um, curious about, um, you've said you've had a lot of great reception from some of the agencies. Um, have any of the agencies pushed back? And if, if so, what have been the reasons for pushback? Sure, so there's been a couple pushback. Um, there's been some old schoolers who think their database is their database. Um, that's a sentiment that's changing in the industry because they realize that these are independent contractors working for 20, 30 different agencies to sustain a lifestyle. And so they know that they're working for other agencies, they just want to be able to better connect with them. And so when we tell them that we're a really great way to get a hold of these people who are on the go to book them for a job you know, here or there, um, it's been really great. The other major pushback we get is some of these agencies will spend a good chunk of money to build their own solution. And the problem with that is they've built it, a person has built it who doesn't understand the industry, and the other issue is that maintaining and maintenance fees of that, that technology. So we fully expect to bring them on board as well in at least a couple of years' time. So thank you. We have a question in the back. Yeah. Great presentation. I've done the whole uh, Craigslist thing for numerous events, yep. and it uh, burns a lot of hours. Um, so I'm not an agency. and You normally don't hire an agency. So what if I'm just a small local brand and I need to hire 10 people for a weekend, is that gonna be an option or? That'll be phase three of the product. <laughs> um, definitely on the horizon, um, not something that is being built right away. Yeah. Got another question in the middle. Um, you mentioned that you have experience in this market or that's why you're focusing on this market. Um, can you talk about your background and how you came to this idea? Do you have experience finding talent for these events, or how did it all come yeah, about? Absolutely, thank you. Sure, so um, before we started the agency, I was working in the field and doing promos, and it was a pain in my rear, because I literally was registered with at least 20 agencies, and they all had different systems, or they were just you know web form, and I'm getting emails from all of them, and, and it's just a mess, and I had to log in if I had, you know, God forbid I changed my address. You know, I have to log into 20 different systems to change it so I can get my checks. And it was just, it was just a crazy mess on that side. So when we started the agency, we were running into the same problem that a lot of these agencies are doing. So we had a web form for you to apply and it goes to my email and then I had to take that email and enter it into Excel and that doesn't have <laughs> photos and this is a very visual industry. And I'm like, there's gotta be a better way. I mean, this is 2015. There's got to be a better way. So I had the aha moment, let's go after this because there's a lot of agencies that are doing the same thing. And so that's when we had the idea for Pop Bookings. Question to your right. Hello. How are you? Um, all right, so I have been a brand ambassador since 2007, sometimes part-time, sometimes full-time. So I absolutely um, get where y'all are coming from and um, think that anything to help streamline the process and make this industry uh, more efficient is definitely needed because there's not a lot out there. Um, I do have a question about your invite only for brand ambassadors. Do you see that changing after you go live or is that kind of your model from as far, you know, no, as far into the future as you can see? What's the reason behind invite only um, versus letting brand ambassadors be able to sign up today and start getting jobs tomorrow? Sure, so one of the major things that the industry didn't quite understand is that we weren't competition. <laughs> they didn't understand, since it's never really been done, they thought, you know, how do we know you're not just gonna steal our data and start staffing? Yeah. So if we have an open forum where they can sign up, that looks a little fishy. Also, um, we don't want people to sign up and, you know, while we are working with just a select few agencies, not receive work right away. And so if you're on a system, you forget about us and, you know, all of a sudden you start getting these texts, so what we're doing right now, it, it exists. There's agencies, you know, and there's people working for these agencies, and we're just taking it all and putting it onto one platform. And so as they start getting work from those agencies, it just makes more sense that way. A little different. <laughs> Got a question on your left. Uh, I noticed on one of your slides you said that, um, obviously, this is your initial industry, but you had listed some other industries. Can you talk a little bit about how you see this uh, being applied in those different verticals. The scalability aspect, thank you. Um, yes, so we're going to tackle the whole gigs section of Craigslist at some point with this product. The 
temporary labor industry, every single one of these people have this issue. If you're a construction crew manager and you need guys to come do a rough in, you go on Craigslist and post a job, but you've got guys who know what they're doing. Same with painting, same with photography for weddings, any, any kind of freelance labor, um, IT. And it all functions the same way. We're focusing on the niche of experiential marketing because that's our niche and that's what we know. But in the future, we do plan to scale this into those other industries. So. Lance has a question. Oh, Lance, could you stand up? That's a cool t-shirt. Are you a brand ambassador today for somebody, <laughs> by the way? Yeah, I'm supporting Pop Bookings as a brand ambassador. <laughs> Um, can you talk a little bit about the pain points that both agencies and talent have with payments um, across hundreds of events, tons of people, and then how are you guys solving it um, with maybe a regional partner? <laughs> yep. Loaded questions are welcome. They, yes. So uh, thank you for the question, Lance. So uh, one of the main ways we're solving this pain point is this guy over here who's a total rock star at, at what he does. But um, we have partnered with a company called Dwalla out of... Uh, they're in Omaha, right? Omaha, and they do ACH transfers. So the agency connects their bank account to, um, to Dwalla, and the talent connects their bank account. And then unlike PayPal or some of the other ones of these ACH transfers, they don't ever have to log in again. So the agency pays the talent on our system, and it directly goes into the talent's bank accounts. So that, that is our main way we're, we're solving that issue. And we have, um, Lance has this nifty pay all feature that he has uh, he's built out that, um, you can pay the talent individually and adjust the payments if, depending on the hours, or you can click pay all and pay your entire talent, everybody that's worked, and then it sends a note to QuickBooks via an API, so. The way they do it now is they manually cut checks mm -hmm. and some agencies will, you know, do it every two weeks, every month. Um, they, somebody might miss, you know, slip through the cracks and, you know, you end up calling them four months later and you still haven't gotten paid. Um, not that I've had that problem before. <laughs> <laughs> and um, that's really how they're doing it now is a lot of manual cutting of checks and it's really time consuming. So by putting it on one platform and it talks to their QuickBooks is completely streamlined and awesome, so. We have a question on your left over here. If I understand correctly, this marketplace today, each agency is basically responsible for having their own talent, finding the talent, they do it on their own, and you're creating, your product is creating a marketplace now for these agencies and this talent to come together to more efficiently work. So this is a marketplace model in terms of a business, and that means you have a challenge of having to go get the agencies and the talent in order for the marketplace to work. I'm curious in terms of the strategy you've had in bringing both sides of that marketplace together, did you intentionally focus on one side or the other? And what challenges have you had with both sides? Because you have to have success on both sides before the model takes off. Yeah, so we're focusing more on the agency side of things since they already have an existing book of talent that they work with. And so they're able to go ahead and start sending those top people jobs and all of that. And so when they sign up with Pop Bookings, they bring their database with them and we help activate those profiles so they can start sending in the work right away. And so with that model, it does stair step pretty naturally. It's um, going to happen and we do have some talent in the system. We have 11 customers and they're in three or four different agencies already. And so those are the people who are going to be the most active accounts and uh, the marketplace when we do open it up into more of a open field, it's a whole different can of worms, that's phase two, um, <laughs> then it will be, um, those people will be the ones that stand out as well. I have a question on your right. Um, so since this is an educational program, will you talk a little bit about your experience with Spark Lab and Accelerator here in town, as well as applying for a launch KC? Oh yeah. Sure. So back in January, we were accepted into a program called Spark Lab KC. Um, many of you probably know them. And um, that was a three month program where we met with a whole bunch of different mentors around town. Uh, we learned a lot, we got you know services and all of that. So it was a, truly a business accelerator program and it truly accelerated our progress as a business. And so we went from zero to 60 as far as 
you know, from idea to launching beta and to getting feedback and then starting, you know, investment conversations with investors. And so um, that was fantastic. And since then, we have also applied to be part of the Launch KC grants competition. And that is during Tech Week. That'll be Friday and we'll be there. Um, we're one of the top 20 finalists. 10 of those finalists will get 50K um, in grants and access to um, co-working spaces around town and different resources as far as mentors and advisors. And so we're pretty excited yeah. for that. Well, and Spark Lab is where uh, we met Lance. We, <laughs> we were in Spark Lab together and then at the very end of the program, we found him at a happy hour one night and he had had a couple whiskeys and we cornered him and said, we want you for equity and <laughs> it worked. So uh, yeah, that was thanks to Spark Lab. <laughs> He just, he just woke up and had woke that t-shirt on, I think. Yeah. <laughs> um, tell us a little bit about the experience um, looking for equity. You know, did that kind of happen, kind of, did Spark Lab help you kind of get to where you needed to be to go there? I know you've had some success and you've had people interested. Oh, yeah. Um, I mean, our primary investor would not be would not have invested in us if it weren't for Spark Lab. The personal connections that these guys made and, and introduced us. And um, a lot of the stuff that you wouldn't think about that you need, like for example, angel tax credits for the state of Kansas. I had no idea what those were. Spark Lab did, and they told us about it. I didn't, when we came in, we didn't have an operating agreement. I'm not kidding. And, and uh, now it's like, that's, that's almost a joke that we didn't have one, but we, we do now. And they're very well connected with Pulsinelli and uh, Pulsinelli extended their services to Spark Lab companies, and now we use Pulsinelli. So it's all of the, the network that they have is fantastic here in the city. So. Great, great. Ready? Mm -hmm. okay. So last final question. What can we as a community do to help you? So right now we are in the dire search to bring someone in-house who is a .NET developer and wants to join our team. And so if you know someone who is very fluent and a rock star at .NET, come find us, please. <laughs> we would love to meet them. So that's really what we're looking for. The other thing is on Friday when we present at Launch KC, there's a People Cho People's Choice Award for one of the 10 companies, which is really cool that they've opened it up to, they pick nine, the 10th one is, every, is the city's choice basically. So. Uh, We'd like your, uh, like your vote for the People's Choice Award for- Keep us in mind. For Launch KC. So. And what time is that? That'll be early, early in the morning. Like um, eight to 12-ish maybe? Eight to 12 is when they're doing presentations and then there will be a big push for the judges and all the voting and all that stuff and then they'll announce it at 3.30, I believe 3.30 on Friday. Well, good luck. Thank you so much for being here today. Thank you everybody. <laughs>
or invite for people who want to check out his new business to go um, talk to Frank today. And then I would like to welcome our second presenter. I'm excited that he is here for Tech Week because I think I've been trying to get him to present for almost four months, right? Um, so I'd like to welcome John Harrison with Filament. Thank you, I'm John Harrison. I'm actually from Wichita, Kansas, so I came a little ways to participate in Tech Week and to be here with you for a million cups. I appreciate your time. And uh, my background is that I'm a musician and I'm also an electrical and computer engineer. Uh, I've worked in the field of engineering and music and uh, also have taught at Wichita State University as a full-time faculty member. And uh, last year I was confronted with a question that I think we all are asked all the time, that we are asked so much that we don't even think about that this is a question. And this is, this is the question. How do you tell somebody that you don't live with, that maybe five miles away or 30 miles away or 500 or 5,000 miles away that you love them? How do you express that? It seems kind of almost like a dumb question, right? It's so obvious, right? You call them or you text them, you know, and, and uh, these are the typical ways that we don't even think about it. This is, this is how we communicate and express our love for somebody. You know, and, and there's some fantastic, beautiful ideas of what this might look like. We're out in the pasture, mother and daughter are emailing their grandmother and, you know, I guess the, the tree probably is giving out a Wi-Fi signal and so they're able to send out and, you know. <laughs> but, and, and, you know, to a large degree, especially for people like us that are fairly tech savvy and very comfortable with, with using words and expressing things with our words, this isn't a terrible way to do it, and it'll always exist, and it's a good way. But it is problematic, and we need to recognize that. So, um, for example, <laughs> the computer has to boot up, and hopefully, you know, you're past Windows Vista, maybe you're at Windows 8, but you still might, you know, computers get viruses, you might be out of minutes. Um, and then, you know, we could talk about a whole other group of people. Uh, people that maybe have less in common with us, or um, for example, my 85-year-old mom. This, you know, I can go through and try to explain to her how to use a smartphone, it's not gonna go well. And, you know, even for, for her, expressing I love you is, um, she doesn't have a very natural way to do this. It, email is something she can do, but it's a little bit, um, no, it's not natural for her. Uh, and she doesn't want to call me because maybe I'm too busy. And, you know, so she doesn't, she doesn't know how to, how to express that. Um, on top of it, besides the complexity of these machines, the fact that they're very verbally based, that um, they require a certain level of technical fluency, they're also not very natural machines for this kind of use. I mean, look at how I'm using my phone now. This is, this is for business, right? This is something when I get a text, it interrupts me, and it's usually telling me something I need to do, pick up the kids at school, there's, a, there's something at work I haven't gotten to do yet, it's reminding me something. This is not, you know, if you look at the design of phones, they're sleek and modern, but they're not designed to sit next to your uh, picture frame in your living room as part of the beauty of the environment that you live in. So, you know, so far I've been talking in a fairly abstract way, but this, is, this was a real problem that I confronted last year when I thought about my family, because, you know, the holiday season was coming up, and I wanted to offer something to my family that would help them to connect, and so that we could all feel that we loved each other and, rem and remember that. And uh, my family spread out uh, across a couple of countries. There's even, I don't know if, I'm probably the only one in the room that has this, but. There's some strain in my family, certain members don't talk to other members, so words are confusing anyway. So sometimes it's best <laughs> if we could find another way. And I wanted to find a more natural way, a way where um, that felt more natural for everybody in the family. And my family doesn't quite look like this, but <laughs> you know, a little kid, a grandparent, how can they all share something in a way to say, I love you? And here's what I came up with. Uh, this is called Philemon and they are decorative Wi-Fi touch lights. Sounds really complicated. Let me show you um, a video. These were the six I made for my family. So that you can kind of see how they work. When you touch one, all of them light the same color. 
So these are things that we share in our living rooms. And so when you come into the living room and the uh, filament is lit, you know that somebody in the family is thinking of the family. It's a way that we can feel connected. It's a way that we can feel connected uh, in a beautiful way that's part of the natural environment that we live in, that's not interruptive, that doesn't require words, and that my mother and a four-year-old can both do. So I never actually planned to be standing here in front of a million cups talking about this. I just was building these for my family. But I got such a positive reception in Wichita, where I live. People said, can you make me a set? I'd like, some, I'd like one for my girlfriend that lives in Australia. Our, uh, our parent is going to a retirement facility, and they need, they need to feel like they're still part of our community. Can you make some for me? And there was so much of that that I decided to run a Kickstarter, which I did. This is a Kickstarter. We got funded. And of course, I asked the obvious question to the backers, why did you back this? And um, I'm getting short on time, so I'll just uh, paraphrase these for you. A very common use that I saw was somebody going to college. And one of the things that was very cool about that was that I saw parents wanted a way to send a smile. But the kids also, I had college students that backed it, looking for a way to connect with their parents that were maybe in a different country. Um, a lot of backers nicknamed it the grandpa or the grandma lamp because it was a way that a grandparent could connect to a kid. And one thing that I saw a lot was that people were using it as a way to feel a presence. So in this particular case, a family member had died, and um, this was a way that the family could share the memory um, that they were thinking of this person. So this is kind of how the Kickstarter went. We ended up raising over $50,000. Um, we have a commitment to make 750 of these, and we need to deliver them by December 15th. So um, I'm in the process of manufacturing 1,000 of them now. And uh, this, is, this is sort of the generation one. And um, I can't make them alone, and I didn't want to make them alone. So I've partnered up with a couple of organizations. One of them is uh, Jonathan Wagner, who's here in the audience from Big Bang. Uh, <laughs> and he... Uh, his company will be providing the cloud service. They presented here in a million cups before. Uh, and um, I also have teamed up with uh, the Wichita Women's Initiative Network that will be assembling the product. Um, what I ideally like to do is have the product be a beautiful thing, not just in what it does, but in how it was made and what it offers in that way. And so um, the Women's Initiative Network helps nonprofits in transition. Um, it helps, I'm sorry, women in transition from abusive situations, and that's a cause that resonates with me. So my next steps are to make sure that the product that I deliver is delivered on time, that it works well, flawlessly, and that I have a really good feedback system so that I know what users think and what kinds of features they want in the future, what kinds of experiences they have with it. I'm making more than, I'm, than I've sold, so I'll have plenty of samples to try in different markets. And, um, since I'm so short on time, I'm actually going to demo them afterwards. So I'm ready for questions. John, thank you for a uh, great presentation. Uh, the other thing that I think you're missing is that these are way less annoying than group text, which is how my family s communicates with one another, right. um, especially with my in-laws. Love them, but you know, I feel like I only need 14 texts every 10 seconds so often in my life. Uh, I'd like to hear a little bit more about the distribution channels, though, that you're looking into. And long term, do you see this being a um, kind of a retail gift item, you know, in kind of traditional gift shops or like a Spencer's or more of a tech item, you know, sitting on the shelf in a Best Buy? Right. Um, well, actually, I'm here partly because I'm looking for advice on that. But I can tell you some of the hunches that I have and some of the ways I'm thinking about that. I'd like to think of this. I think it's dangerous to go down the tech channel too far. I feel like people start thinking, and this is where my friends go. We're all techies. Oh, you know, you could add this feature. You could have a screen on it. It would do this. What if it talked to you? And I think part of the beauty of it is the simplicity of it. There's not even a button on it. All you do is you touch it. And um, that, that, you know, for my mom, 
she could just plug it in and it immediately worked. And so I want to I want to preserve that. So I'm thinking more of the direction of gift item. Um, I recognize that, um, and the last slide mentioned this quickly. I recognize that I have a challenge of that. I've kind of described an item that I think is good for everybody, and that that's not a very good, very powerful way to start a Mac, uh, marketing strategy. And I'm kind of leaning toward the idea of looking at. Uh, uh, people that are in transition to maybe retirement facilities, um, they are being removed from their community. Often they don't want to be removed. Um, and they're getting disconnected, and uh, this can be a way that maybe they could stay connected. So it might be interesting to explore even the B2B model where I could work with some retirement communities, and I'm trying to make those connections now um, to see what it would be like to try um, keeping those connections that way. When, when you look at it, I think uh, your insights, I think, are, are very intuitive, and uh, that's good. That's not a bad thing, necessarily, by any means. But you look at it as a product. I mean, it's a hardware solution, correct. It's not software-driven. It's hardware-driven. And it's within kind of the Internet of Things space. Um, right. when, you, when you talk about, like, aging as a potential demographic, I mean, is this a one-off product, or is there, like, additional iterations you kind of build on to this? I mean, because in a sense, you're looking at being, like, a hardware company or a gifts company in that regard. Right. Um, what I like to think is that this is more of a platform than a product. I feel like there's um, the Internet of Things, it's, it's hot, right? But most of the work that's being done in that area is about control and information. I mean, if you look at the Nest thermostat, you get to control your thermostat perfectly based on where you are and what time it is, and you get to know exactly if your garage door is open and all those kinds of things. There isn't that much exploration yet, I think, about emotion and relationship. Apple's doing some. They've done some stuff with, um, with the watch where you can feel each other's heartbeat. Um, there's the pillow that maybe you guys have heard about where you can feel the heartbeat. Um, those things still tend to be on the techie side. The pillow requires configuration with Bluetooth and all that stuff. So I am kind of looking at what other possibilities are there for simple Internet of Things devices that um, are centered around emotion and relationship and, and simplicity. And this, this is my first exploration in that. That's why it's so important I get the feedback from the people that use it. Could you speak to price point as well uh, in terms of what you, I mean, obviously you sold them through Kickstarter, but is there a kind of price point in mind you have for it that is still able to be done? Uh, well, so right now, um, the Kickstarter price was $60 each. Um, I think that's probably a little bit high for um, hitting a, a large channel. And I think that if I'm able to manufacture in larger quantities than 1,000, I can lower that price uh, as well as, you know, what my focus right now is, is um, getting the product out in time rather than optimizing uh, the price point. So my hope is to get it close to half that. I think that would be a, a more marketable um, price point. Um. So I, I would have been fine if this was just like a cool, engaging art project, and I think you would have been fine too, and you've sort of been thrown into, <laughs> you found you're solving a real human problem. Right. Um, and I, I want to grill you on vision and strategy, and you've already sort of admitted that like you're, you're figuring that out right now, so instead I'll just ask a personal question. Um, are you... Do you want to do this full time? Do you want to grow a business? Are you just sort of exploring right now? Like, what if not the vision for the business? What what do you want your involvement to be in the future of Filament? Right. Um, well, I'm open to anything. I'd love this to be a passion that I can follow as a full time thing. Uh, so yeah, I'd, I'm looking to grow this into a business that um, where I'm a part of that, and this is what I do. Is that what you're asking? Did I answer that? Yeah, basically. Okay. And, and like, are you thinking, like, you, you are going to be the CEO? Are you going to find somebody else to do the business thing and you'll continue with product? Like, where do you see yourself? What's your role to move this thing forward? Yeah, I don't, I don't think, um, I think that marketing, business, the strategy, I think that would be best left to somebody else, actually. It's not an area I have a lot of experience in. I know how to code. I know how to play the violin. <laughs> so, um, I think I'm good at generating the ideas. I, um, so I see myself more on that technical end. Uh, so a CEO might be an appropriate position. Thanks. Question on your right. 
Can you unpack a little more, the, just um, the application? Um, okay, so it turns four or five different colors. I mean, if, is it- 255, a, but go ahead. Okay. <laughs> so, so they say there's a network of a family of six. How would I know that a message came from my sister or whatever? So you want to know who sent the message? Or turns it to, changes the color, yeah. Who did it come from? Right, so um, there's some configuration that's possible when you buy filament. Uh, the way that they, by default, work is the way that I felt it was best that they work for my family, which is that you touch it, it lights one random color of 255. Um, if you touch it again, it changes shades of that color, so you know the same person is touching it. So that person can find a color that speaks to them. If somebody responds, it changes a dramatic color. So what you don't know is who touched it with that configuration. For my family, that's the best, because um, it's best when we're functioning as a community than a set of individuals, because since there's tension between some individuals, it's best that way, and that's one of the things that this can offer that group texting can't offer. Um, some people, though, some of the Kickstarter backers said, I want to know that this person touched it. So when you configure the light, you can set it so that you are a certain range of colors. So each person could choose what range they are, and then they could go through those colors to, uh, yeah, when they touch it. And then just a follow-up question of maybe the, the next version, but this <clears throat> connecting cloud technology, if it were connected to, say, um, a digital picture frame. So I want to send a picture of, to mom, who is not tech savvy, right. of where we are, or of an old, old picture I find. Would this um, enable that tech, that type well, of? Well, technically, I mean, from the technology standpoint, that's no problem. I mean, once once we have the cloud, um, you know, working and what we send and and the amount of you know a picture is not that much data. That's not a big deal. It would be a matter of finding a way to do that that it still in, um, embraces the simplicity of the design and um, is some you know something that people of all ages and um, and different levels of technical and physical abilities could participate in. That would be the challenge there, not technically. Got a question in the middle? John, first, great job. I, I love the simplicity of it. I love uh, that you're trying to keep it simple. Uh, and I'll tack on to uh, Jeff's comment around uh, getting away from group messaging. It also helps prevent the misfires of love through group messaging. So that's, <laughs> that's very good. I've never seen that. I don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> right, right, right. <laughs> uh, my question is, and I'm a data junkie, um, have you thought about uh, how you can possibly collect information of the, the, you know, the transfers of, of the messages or you know the signals of love through this and create something something like maybe the filament love index that you could then sell to other companies that might use it as a, as like a, a barometer in the marketplace of what's going on from communication. Right. Yeah, that's a good question. Um, I was exploring with Jonathan actually just yesterday. What kind of data can we capture? You know, do we know which groups are doing what and all those kinds of things? Um, I want to be careful about what I share with the end user because I don't want, for example, you know, we were talking about each person having a different color, right? Somebody's going to keep score if you do that, right? <laughs> so, oh, yeah, well, you know, Susie hasn't touched it in a long time. I haven't seen blue, you know. So, so you have to be careful about um, what kind of information you're sharing to make sure that you're really embracing something that's a positive experience for people. But I do think that there's a lot of um, possibility in the, in, the, in the data that you capture and what you might do with it. I think your idea is really good. Um, and the trick right now is to just make sure we build a platform where that data is capturable, and we are, so. John, I've got a question to you, right? Um, as I help work the room and walk around, I realized um, when I say hi to people uh, in a silent way, I'm kind of doing the head nod thing. So I see what you're doing is kind of the digital long distance version of that. Now, uh, my buddy Nate here, it, let's assume Nate had one of these, and one of his loved ones sent him a, t a color. What if Nate misinterprets that signal? Like somebody saying, hey dude, you need to trim your beard or something like that. <laughs> I mean, then he could be kind of annoyed. So, I mean, understanding what the signal means, I think is kind of an interesting, you know, because it is family. so simple, it is so simple. Right, it's really, I mean, what does it mean? It has no meaning at all. So it's really up to the community. It could mean that, you know, little Johnny has, you know, successfully used the big toilet again. It can mean anything you want, right? <laughs> but, um, you know, I, 
I think, um, I think because it doesn't use words, it's less susceptible to, inter to misinterpretation. I think because it, it is um, intended to be a warm part of your environment, it's less likely to trigger that instant annoyance that I often feel when my phone buzzes. By the way, it's been buzzing a lot. <laughs> you know, um, so, and you can always unplug it, right? Have you, have you considered um, offering like a strobe light version of this? <laughs> so, you know, I've done my best to try to make the colors themselves and the way that it lights and the way that it decays over time to be part of the beauty of it. Um, my intention is that it's all beautiful and warm and um, embracing in that way. So, you know, if I, if I added a strobe thing, I mean, I'd, I'd wanna still try to keep that, um, that sense of tranquility is the way I'm imagining it. Now, I'm open to any conversation, but that's kind of where, where my mindset has been from creating it. So. A question in the back. Hi. Um, I I think this is a really fascinating idea, um, especially the idea of communicating things non-verbally in a digital space. And so it said uh, on your bio that you, um, this was one of many products that you're considering. And um, I just wanted to hear what some other ideas were uh, that you had for you know, conveying emotions uh, across distances. Yeah, I don't know actually if I have anything concrete to offer you today about that. Um, Sorry to disappoint, <laughs> but um, you know, I've been really almost trying to shut that part of my brain off for a bit. I love to generate ideas, but I'm at a point where I have to produce this product. So um, you know, uh, grab my email, we'll talk more. Question right center. Um, I just had a question about, for the price point, the indestructibility of it, given with small kids at home or even in a college dorm, those parties that go on. Uh, the likelihood of it being damaged or hit repeatedly by my small three-year-old. Right. Yeah, I've done my best with, um, with how to construct this first design. Um, I'm imagining, you know, one of the things that I, I didn't totally realize is that when people buy these, it's like buying a watch. You don't just buy the functionality, you buy something that you feel like speaks to you and works for you in terms of the design. I have one design. so. Um, so in the future, I'll have more designs, and that will allow, you know, some of them will be less destructible than others. Some of the things, some of the decisions I made to try to address what you're saying is that it's not made out of glass, it's made out of acrylic. Um, you know, the, the trim, uh, these were prototypes, but the trim of the manufactured ones is much tougher and helps give support to the entire um, thing. And, um, I know from my own experience of dropping these that they're, that they're actually pretty tough. <laughs> but yeah, that's a concern. And, um, and I think in all the designs that, that needs to be weighed because unlike regular lights, you touch them a lot, you, yeah. Question here in the center. Hi, I'm, I'm curious if where you think the, the core value is. Is it in the hardware or is it in the sort of anonymous, um, not thoughtless, but you know, objectiveless uh, communication. Because I, I feel like there's, I, I think it's an awesome idea. But I think that there's a lot of opportunity, like you said, to kind of make it a platform and go beyond just the hardware. Because that's what, that's what seems like the value is to me is that, that I can just, I don't have to think of a message or I don't, ha and it doesn't have to mean anything. It's just, I'm thinking of my family and that, that can come in a lot of different ways. I'm curious where you think the, the value is. Yeah, I agree with you that that's where the value is, is the concept, um, the, the way of presenting it. In terms of the hardware and the software, you know, you don't need multiple PhDs to figure out how to build at least a, a prototype of this kind of system. Of course, we all know that as you try to scale things up, things change, but, um, you know, so, so that's kind of where I'm thinking, is the focus is on the emotional, the relationship, and that this is, that's what this product, in essence, offers. There's a lot of different hardware that could do that. This is the hardware that I'm choosing in order to, you know, hit the price point and make something financially viable. We have one in here in the middle. Good morning, John. Um, I love this idea. Thank and you. you may have touched on this already. Um, I'm going to email you because I've got a lot of questions. But so will this, is there a distance maximum that this can reach? Can this go overseas? Will it require... Uh, purchasing a data, 
plan or is it going to be included in what you're offering is for just the product itself? So um, since you mentioned distance, and I meant to bring this up before, this is a filament that's in Wichita. And uh, you know, if both moons are in the same, are in the, oh, what happened? Yeah, so you can see that that one just lit the same color. So you know at least it works as far as Wichita, right? <laughs> so, um, but they will work across the world, right? So they just connect through the internet. Um, it, and so the example I used earlier of somebody getting one to um, connect with their girlfriend in Australia is a real example. Um, we have people that are connecting with um, like a, a goddaughter in Brazil. So there's really no limit to the distance at all. Jeff, do you have a question? Yeah, I had a, a question uh, regarding, to your left over here, uh, functionality, sitting down, back on the panel. Uh, <laughs> and really kind of maybe oversimplistic, but I see this, you know, my wheels are spinning, and one in my mother-in-law's house and one in my son's room. Right. But he's four, and you'll find any reason to get out of bed. So is there an on-off switch so when he goes to bed we can turn it off? Right. Um, so one of the configurations that you can do, so when you first set it up, um, because it doesn't know how to connect to the Wi-Fi, it creates its own um, soft AP uh, so that you can connect to it using any device that has Wi-Fi. And at that point, you give it the Wi-Fi information. But you can also, if you want, configure things like a silent time. Um, but it actually makes a really nice nightlight because you can see it's a nice way for grandpa or grandma to actually say goodnight because it, it fades over time. And these are fading over just a couple of minutes because I'm demoing them. But typically, and again, that's configurable, they fade over a couple of hours. You could set them to not fade at all if you want. Um, yeah, so did that answer your question? Yeah. Question on your right. Hi, uh, I'm interested in your thoughts on as you try to scale up your production assuming you're going to do U.S. made, you're currently using the Women in Transition. Is that a short-term solution just to get you off the ground, or do you have aspirations to continue with sort of a social conscience with this product? And I ask that question because all the product attributes and questions are absolutely germane, but we're in Kansas City, and this falls right in the Hallmark Cards wheelhouse relative to maintaining relationships with families and, and all that stuff. And they've got the infrastructure and distribution, they've got market share with soccer moms, and they've got Asian pr production that it's gonna be hard to compete with. So, but what they can't compete with is that social conscience in your production. So I'm curious if you see that as a marketing thing in addition to all the product attributes. I do see it as a marketing thing, and it would also make me feel a lot better about this journey. So it's something that, um, that I, really, I really want to pursue. I feel like, um, yeah, in the end, if I end up with uh, knockoffs, and I'm in some sort of price battle with pretty much anyone, <laughs> I'm probably gonna lose. So that's not, the way to, um, that's not the way to differentiate this product. It's going to be things like the social consciousness of it, and also the fit and finish and the reliability of it. And I have the advantage of getting there first, so if I can build the trust at this point, and I think this is gonna be a gift, you know, when I give something to my mom, I don't wanna get embarrassed about how it works. I'm willing to take a little bit of a risk when I buy something, but if I'm sharing something, then I really need to know that it's going to reliably work. And so, you know, I think that's gonna be my focus is it works well, reliably, and it's doing good in the world. And um, yeah. I have a question in the middle. And you had a question too, right? Yeah. A great presentation. Thank you. Um, and I love how you're adding the emotion and tech and all that great stuff. I do have a question uh, with dealing with acrylic. Um, is the, are they able to get it customized, like a family name, or you already have the template set? Because I know uh, with the CNC machines and things like that, it's not too much of a price point uh, to customize, but have you thought of, is it just customized, or do you have set templates uh, for them to choose from? Uh, my intention is that it will be customizable and that there will be some templates for them to choose from, um, but for this first generation, that was just too much to take on, so it's just this one design. And, and the feedback I got is part of why I offered that, um, this is like buying a watch. You know, some people didn't like the design, and some people, you know, it's a, it's a fairly um, traditional type of look in some ways, and people want, some people wanted a more modern, contemporary look. So, so it needs to move that direction, I see it going that direction. Yeah. Oh, I'm sorry, hang on one second. Hang on a second be on a roll and remind themselves even to, hey, do more, excel yourself. Wait, I don't, I don't know if I understood. 
I think it was uh, color coded, color coded reminders. Is, is that what you said? Mm -hmm. Set your goal big, excel mm -hmm. better than you thought you could do. Right. <laughs> All right, so, so we've got to wrap it up. We're out of time. Okay, sure. So thank you so much. Uh, before I let you go, we have one final question. What is your favorite Major League Baseball team? Oh, crap. You asked me a question like that? It's got to be the Red Sox. I come from Boston. Okay. <laughs> I'll let you. That, you know, I didn't, I, I was hoping you said Royals. I, I'm sorry, you guys. Is it, yeah, it's Kansas City Royals. Is that right? <laughs> Okay. I'm not, I, I'm I not a not, sports guy. This I didn't is, want this. you to get a bunch of leers and booze there. So what can we as a community do for you? Well, I think, I think probably from listening to my presentation, you have a pretty good idea of that. I mean, I, I have some grasp of the technical. I have, I have the ideas, but um, the structure of how, of how to market this, um, how to structure it as a business, um, how to scale it to something where I'm not making 1,000 of them, but 10,000 or 100,000 of them. These are challenges. Um, I don't... Um, there's a lot about manufacturing that I've learned that I don't know. I know how to, I'm a maker, and I know how to make things in my basement, but you know, transitioning to um, how to manufacture things is definitely a challenge for me. So those are some of the ideas of some of the things I'm looking for. I know also that um, you know, I bootstrapped this, and that's great, I got as far as Kickstarter, but at some point it's gonna take a little bit more um, real financial investment in order to make this thing take off in time. And if it doesn't take off in time, then it could get knocked off, and, um, and I would be at a real disadvantage at that point. Great, well thank you for coming out. Appreciate it. It's here for John. Thank you. So, um, thanks everybody for showing up today. Um, we will be back next week, and if you're interested to see if um, Jeff and Andy make it back for a third week in a row, Let's see if these guys make it, or maybe Nate will be back. So if you, if you have any interest in one day presenting at One Money Cups, please, please raise your hand for me. I'd love to talk to you about that. Um, please come up and introduce yourselves to one of the organizers. And um, we will see you next week at the same time, same place. So have a great week. <laughs>